next speaker, uh, Gavin Crooks. Uh, and Gavin is from X, which is uh, part of Alphabet, uh, Google's parent company. Gets to do some really cool stuff there. I'm sure he's going to tell us about qubits, uh, circuits, and quantum gates and quantum gradients. Thanks. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so, I'm at, uh, at X, uh, and as Nathan said, X is um, the company formerly known as Google X. We used to be part of Google, and now we're part of Alphabet. Uh, a, a sibling company of Google. So that's rather confusing, because I just say X, nobody knows what, what I mean, right? Um, and, and we now have a quantum group uh, within X. It's relatively new. Uh, and we are distinct from Google's you know, hardware group. And so we're sort of doing the quantum things that aren't the, the quantum hardware. So we're doing things like looking at quantum machine learning algorithms, um, but, but more broadly than just quantum computing, looking at things like quantum sensing, quantum communication. Uh, lots of really cool things going on, most of which I can't tell you about right now. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to advertise we have a residency program. If you're a, a PhD student, um, you can come to X for a summer, like three months, and hang out on a project. So there's an AI residency, which is sort of generic to all of X. You get embedded with a team and do sort of applied AI. Um, and then there's a quantum residency program that's specific to our group. And uh, this is actually pretty cool. There are people who come in and actually started up real projects, which are now ongoing um, at X. Um, and oh, yeah, this, so this is what X actually looks like. Uh, this was a picture that uh, was published in Wired a couple of days ago, so I can show you this. This is public. Uh, this is like one floor down from where we are. Uh, where I am is fewer robots. Um, <laughs> so this is the, like, the latest project out of X to go public. Um, uh, announced, uh, it's still part of X. These robots trundle around and they sort trash. So they're using reinforcement learning to try to learn how to do useful things for us. Um, so things that have come out of X is like Google's startup incubator. So um, um, uh, Waymo, the self-driving cars, was an X project. Uh, Google Brain was an X project before getting folded into Google Research. Uh, more recently, there's been like Loon, which is internet by balloons. So lots of really, really cool stuff going on. Um, and I'll also just advertise from our group uh, one cool thing, uh, this software package called Tensor Network. So a tensor network, lowercase, uh, is a network of tensors. It's a tool that came out of uh, sort of quantum chemistry uh, calculations. We want to do calculations of uh, uh, properties and materials. And so uh, you think of diagrammatically a vector is a blob of one one leg, uh, a matrix is a blob with two legs. A multivariate tensor has many legs. So like a quantum state, you can think of it as a big tensor. Each leg is a, is a qubit. And so a quantum circuit is a tensor network, is a simple example. Um, and this software is designed to make it easier to build these networks. And it takes care of the back end optimization, numerical optimization. You can run these things fast on GPUs and uh, even TPUs. Um, OK, so I thought today I would just talk about something old. Um, because why not? Um, I thought I'd talk about the space of gates. Uh, this is um, what I'm, most of what I'm going to talk about is sort of dates a lot of it to sort of the like mid 2000s. Really useful stuff. I think everybody should know this. Um, it just didn't make it into the standard textbooks because the standard textbook got written before this was figured out. So um, I sort of evangelize this. I think this is a really good thing to try to understand. Because as you look at these quantum algorithms, as you look at people's different hardware, you're going to run into lots and lots of different quantum gates. And it's hard to keep them all straight and how they interrelate to each other. Um, but in fact, they have a really simple mathematical structure, which makes it really easy to sort of keep track of them. So I'll first sort of give the example of one qubit gates, but the more interesting case is two qubit gates. Um, so in, in for one qubit gates, you know, we have this block sphere. The block sphere is a way of keeping track of uh, states, quantum states. So every, every sp um, point in the sphere represents a different quantum sp um, state of one qubit. So this is the same sphere mathematically, but now it's the state of um, the sphere of gates. So any one qubit gate you can write in this form, where there's some vector, um, some angle that you rotate about in the block sphere, 
and some vector in that block sphere. And so every gate in one qubit gate uh, can be represented as a point in this sphere. And it's like the block sphere opposite, uh, the opposite sides of the sphere glued together. So uh, x is here on this x-axis, x is also here. Y, Y, Z, Z. And then all our other one qubit gates we're familiar with just uh, plop out on this sphere somewhere. Right in the middle is the identity gate. S is the square root of Z, so it's halfway down. T is the square root of S, halfway down from there. And then less commonly, but they still you run across sometimes V is the square root of X. Uh, this H is called the pseudo Hadamard, and the actual Hadamard is up on this axis here uh, on the edge of the sphere between X and Z. So it's just a way of um, keeping track of this set of, a set of gates, one qubit gates. Okay, that's fine, but what about two qubit gates? So the problem is that a two qubit gate has lots of parameters. So a two qubit gate is a, uh, a four by four unitary matrix, and that has 15 free parameters. So the way to keep track of this is that uh, for unitary matrix, you get one parameter for every entry in the matrix, uh, but then you lose one because you don't care, care about phase. So four times four minus one. So that's 15 parameters, that's a big space. That's too much to keep track of. But as it turns out, um, what you really care about, if you think about a two qubit gate, is that sort of uh, two qubitness, the non-local part. That's the interesting part. There's this less interesting part, which is the one qubit bit. So I can rewrite this 15 parameter gate as this, this gate, two qubit gate, and a bunch of one qubit gates. Each one qubit gate is three parameters. So what I'm left over with for the two qubit gate is just three parameters, three parameters I can keep track of. Um, so you see this called like the KAK decomposition because that was just the notation uh, that was used in one of the original papers or the canonical decomposition. So the idea is you take any two qubit gate take out the local parts, the one qubit gates, just leave behind this interesting uh, uh, two qubit bit. And mathematically, it just comes out like this. You have um, poorly xx, yy, zz, and one parameter for each. Um, so the space then has, uh, turns out to be uh, a cube. So instead of being a sphere this time, it's still three-dimensional, this time it's a cube. And you go off one edge and you come back in the other, so it has the topology of a torus. Uh, but then there turns out to be lots and lots of, um, for some reason my fingers moved. Um, no matter, I'll just skip to the next slide, which has it in the right place. There we go. So it turns out there's lots and lots of um, symmetries. And to remove all those symmetries, Instead of a cube, you get this sort of pyramid shape. All our favorite two qubit gates are represented by some point within this volume. Um, so the axes are uh, the x axis this way, y axis is that way, z axis is straight up. And so where's our favorite gates? Well, the identity is here, and then there's a symmetry, so it means it comes up on the other side. Um, this x axis, you get C naught right here. I swap is at the back corner. Swap is at the top. Then we get things like the square root of swap. Um, turns out all like uh, this is like half a unit, one unit, half a unit up. So there's interesting gates at every quarter unit. Um, so this is the square root of C naught, square root of I swap. Uh, there's only one square root of I swap. Again, there's a symmetry. It looks like there's two, but they're again they're related by local transformation. So uh, who cares? There's really only one. But you get two. Um, two square roots of swap. And then at the back edge over there, there's the quantum Fourier transform. Um, and what else do we have? Oh, this is called the B gate, uh, which is short for Berkeley. Um, turns out that was a, a, a gate the, that was investigated because it has the interesting property that uh, you only need two B gates to make any uh, two qubit gate. So you want to make any two qubit gate, you need three C knots. Uh, two C knots gives you any gate in the bottom plane. Three C knots, you can get any gate in the whole volume. Uh, it turns out with a B gate, you only need two uh, B gates. But it's not a natural gate, so it doesn't turn up often in actual um, hardware, in that sense. Um, 
And this helps you keep track, I think, of uh, this plethora of gates. Because there's lots of gates you'll run across which are really just repeats of the same gate. So, for example, C0 is really the same as CZ. Because you can transform one into the other just with local gates. And typically, in a lot of these hardware platforms, it's the two qubit gates that are the expensive ones. And the one qubit gates are relatively cheap and low error. Um, so, you know, the, the difference between C0 and CZ is not that big. Um, And another one I like is the double C knot. You run across this in circuits lots of times. Two, two C knots back to back uh, is actually locally equivalent to an I swap. So again, it gets you on that back edge, uh, this back corner over here. Uh, so all of the uh, planes in this volume, and, um, edges and planes have um, meaning. So this bottom edge, which is the, that's the surface, uh, is that surface that you can get from two C knots, and those turn out to be the orthogonal gates. Those are the gates you can represent locally uh, up to a local transformation uh, by orthogonal matrix. Um, so these ones are the special orthogonal gates. They have determinant one. These ones this way actually are the improper orthogonal gates, which is the one orthogonal gates we have determinant one, uh, minus one. Um, and then you have volumes two. So this little pyramid here turns out if you take, um, you know, as, as you try to um, uh, uh, design a quantum circuit, you, you look at the repertoire of gates that are available in your hardware and you ask, well, what set of interesting gates can I get out of this? So, so um, it turns out the square root of I swap in some setups might be a natural thing, uh, a gate for, for some of these uh, hardware platforms. What if I have a sandwich with two I swaps? And you ask, what set of gates can you generate out of that? So with two C knots, you can only get that bottom plane. Uh, but with uh, two uh, square root of I swaps, uh, you get this little pyramid of, of gates. And the B gate there is in the bottom middle, and this gate at the top is like um, I call the ECP gate, because it's the only point in this thing that doesn't seem to have a name, so I call it the ECP, um, which is named after someone who works at the gate, uh, a compiler guy who sort of figured this out originally. Um, oh, and then, and then um, the, the you know, Again, this, is, this sort of helps you understand the different hardware platforms. So uh, Google's new Sycamore hardware platform has sort of a natural gate, what it call, uh, what's called in CERC um, FSIM, or elsewhere you see it called XXY. And uh, this is a gate with two parameters. It turns out what that represents is the top three faces of this pyramid, so one, two, three faces. You can get anywhere in those three faces uh, in principle with this um, FSIM gate. But again, as we design our, um, as we design our uh, algorithms or circuits for these near-term machines, everything is so noisy, we have a very few gates we can get away with. So uh, we, you really need to design to the hardware. You need to use the natural, uh, try to use the natural gates of that particular hardware. And for this, uh, this is the Sycamore chip that Google did the um, supremacy experiment on recently. Um, which I agree is a terrible term because not just because it's just doesn't it's not it's not supreme right <laughs> it's a it's, it's a useless it's it's a supremacy you know if I you know, air supremacy right second world war means that you, you dominate in every possible way whereas this means that the quantum computer can do one problem better than uh, the classical computer so it's there yeah so but it's good marketing, right? I guess. Um, but but whatever. It's, it's still it's still a, it's still a good. Um, you know, we should we should celebrate it. So it's a it's a milestone. Uh, but it's uh, you know still a long road to go. Oh, okay. So turns out um, for this for this uh, um, chip, they actually tuned up one particular FSIM gate, and it turned out the one they tuned up is on this back edge. Um, this back edge actually is called um, uh, uh, P-Swap in uh, PyQuil. Did you 
Where did that come from? That's the only place I know it from. Right. Yeah, that's what it stands for. But do you guys just invent it? And because? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the only place I know this yeah. this this yeah. this thing is is from PyQuil. We may have a lot of reasons. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's cool. No, 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 because it was it. Yeah, it turned out to be this back edge, and this back edge didn't have a name apart from um, PSwap. And um, so at the top is swap, and at the bottom is I swap, and the middle is the two qubit quantum Fourier transform. It turns out this sycamore gate is kind of weird. Um, it's one sixth of a way up this back edge. Um, and the reason is, just because of the way the, uh, the hardware worked out, that particular parameterization, the gate is really fast. And if it's really fast, it also means they can make it relatively low noise. So it's the natural gate for this particular hardware system. It's not the natural gate if I want to start just thinking about, well, quantum circuits, I'd start with C naught or something. But it's the natural gate for this uh, particular hardware. So therefore, again, we need, to, we need to understand what these gates are. And it's a sick for the way up this back edge. Um, compiling to this is actually kind of interesting. There's just keeping a, uh, um, um, a watch on like the CERC um, um, pull requests. Uh, so what they're doing is the Sycamore, well, that's the ideal Sycamore gate. But in practice, every point in the, in the circuit is actually getting slightly different gate, with slightly different um, parameters. But it turns out what you can do is you can line up two sycamores as a sandwich, and you can build that B gate I was talking about, the Berkeley gate. And two Berkeley gates will give you any gate in the, um, in the, in the, in the pyramid. So they know how to take two sycamores and turn it into a B gate. You know how to make any gate in this pyramid out of two B gates. So therefore, you can actually compile uh, to the sycamore gate, even though there's this variation in the, in the points. Great. Um, well, I mean, OK, I was only going to touch on, on quantum gradients. So one of the other useful things that here is uh, this parameter shift rule, which is a really, as Maria was saying, um, a really neat way of being able to take gradients of these quantum circuits and therefore being able to do um, gradient descent and try to optimize these circuits. But this parameter shift rule has this requirement in it that the, the, the structure of the gate, of the Hamiltonian of the gate, has to have this particular structure to it. And at first sight, that looks like it's restrictive. <coughs> Turns out it's not. Turns out you can always recast any gates into a gate that you can do parameter shift rules on it. So this is a particular example I worked out for just as an exercise. So the cross-resonant gate is something that's natural for certain uh, superconducting qubit um, hardware. Um, and it has this sort of structure of a bunch of parameters. Um, and it's, you know, you can't directly take the parameter shift rule for this gate. You have to, but you can decompose it. If you can decompose it into other gates you can take the parameter shift rule of, you can take the parameter shift rule uh, gradient of this whole gate. So it turns out the full decomposition of this thing uh, and the canonical decomposition gives you this bunch of stuff, and then it turns out to be horribly complicated with some the not simple math, but it's doable. Um, so in principle, we can always apply this parameter shift rule. We might have to jump through some hoops to get it to work, but it's a really powerful way of thinking about, um, about gradients. But just to, to reiterate some of the questions that came up last time, uh, we, it absolutely is an open problem about the right way to uh, optimize these, these quantum circuits. Um, the problem with the parameter shift rule is that you get out one gradient at a time. So you have to run the circuit twice, you get out a gradient of one, one, one gate. And your circuit can have many gates in it. And that gradient's noisy because you're only ever going to take a finite number of shots. So, you know, is there a way around that problem? Possibly. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's still very much an open problem what the right way to, to do this is. Um, I mean, I've done some um, sort, of, sort of proof of principle back of the envelope calculations that you can actually optimize some non-trivial circuits with a number of shots on actual hardware that's not unreasonable. Um, but then the hardware itself is also noisy. So there's an extra, extra level of complication. We're going to have to try it and find out. It's very much an open problem at this point. Um, so yeah, I'll just finish up. Uh, just some links. Um, this is my sort of rough notes about this stuff. If you'd like to do some paper craft, 
there's this nice little model you can print out and you cut it out and you fold it up and you'll have your own little pyramid uh, just to keep track of where all the little gates are. Um, it has a couple of extra ones I didn't mention, just some of these other edges are labeled. Uh, this is uh, the DB gates, which uh, again, my friend Rigetti Eric came up with. I forget what it stands for. It's, it's some weird American cultural reference. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dagwood, uh, Bunston Dagwood. Does it make any sense? I don't know. Huh? Yeah, maybe. Because it makes because it makes really big sandwiches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it turns out if you take again, you you take any of these gates on this back edge, which might be generated naturally in certain hardware platforms, and you sandwich two of them up and ask what set of other gates can I get. Um, you get quite a lot with the swear word I swap, but the sort of the best one in terms of the biggest uh, volume of gates you can get is this DB gate. Um, and oh, I wrote a paper on gradients. Uh, there's um, you know Penny Lane. This is actually where I learned about this whole stuff. It's from the Penny Lane software. It's really good for this stuff, for the gradients. Uh, but I have some of my own example code, and this lets you do this, um, explore some of these uh, uh, um, issues with looking at these. Uh, space of gates. Um, so again, this is all uh, actually pretty old stuff, lots of references in here. It's just one of those tools that should be sort of widely known because it really helps understand this, this, this split before of gates that you tend to run into in the literature. Um, and questions? Um, so you mentioned that it kind of suffices to consider just three parameters in order to describe any any two bit two qubit gate in this kind of pyramid volume. But what happens to all the other one one qubit parameters? Do they stay fixed or do they change depending on what two qubit gate you're considering? It depends on yes, which two. So I give you know I have C naught versus C Z. They have the same canonical parameters and the but but they have different one qubit gates on the outside. Okay, cool. But so yeah, so they're, they're they're the same gate up to this local transformation. So like QFT. Yeah. It's not static. Well, QFT and C not have complete are completely different on in this case. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, as you, it depends how things are prioritized up. As you have, you have a, a gate that that moves through the space of two qubit gates, then your set of one qubit gates change. So, again, if you go back to this particular example, this cross resonant gate, like this is the two qubit gate, but the one qubit gates are also prioritized, and, and as you move these parameters they move in, in sort of un uh, uh, complicated ways. Okay. So it can be complicated, but it, again, yeah. Further questions? Yes. Get some revenge now. Yeah. He was calling you out during the talk. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask, have you thought a little bit about the multi-qubit case extending beyond two, and is there anything you've been looking at there? You mean like free? Yeah, it, um, for free qubit gates and above, there doesn't appear to be anything uh, analogous to this. The space just gets so big. Um, by the time you have free qubit gates, you're at 63 parameters. Um, so, yeah, I haven't seen anything that really has this same nice structure to it for the free qubit gate or above. <laughs>